I was one of the first people in Australia to have heard the story of the Christ. It was in Canberra, in Parliament House, and I was so moved that I was nearly in tears. And I found it very hard to control my voice as I made my plea to hear the name of every man read aloud. I, because I believed then and I believe now that every man who went on that voyage deserved the Victoria Cross. Perhaps I was so moved because I was a woman. But to the survivors today, I want to send my love, the love of an old woman who for nearly 80 years or over 80 years has loved Australia and been proud of it and proud of all the men and women who've given their all in its service. But particularly, and I believe this goes for every decent Australian, I am full of gratitude and pride for the men who went on this voyage, for all their selfless devotion and heroism. They've given us the tradition that will last as long as time will last. The men who went on the quite. Bounded by the Palm Beach Peninsula to the east and the Karingai National Park to the west is a peaceful stretch of water called Pitwater. Its northern approaches are guarded by Lion Island. Only a few miles north of Sydney by road, it is a safe area for many small craft that use these quiet waters. Church Point is situated at its lower end and here a large marina supplies the needs of boat owners and mooring facilities for many of the larger vessels. Church Point reflects opulence and wealth and yet not far from the marina, tied to a rotting wharf, is an ancient boat. Ugly in appearance, she is in stark contrast to her surroundings. Here split and broken timber show the ravages of time that not even the many coats of paint she has received can disguise. She fights an endless battle against rust and corrosion. The wheelhouse is situated almost halfway along her 78 foot length and an unusual insignia has been attached to it near the doorway. She's a strange craft with a strange name. She is called Crite. The Crite was built sometime in the 1920s, and it's only through the generosity and dedication of many people and organizations who give their time voluntarily that she's able to remain operational. But why is she so important? Why has so much time and money spent on so ancient a vessel? Our story begins with a man named Ivan Lyon. Ryan was a captain in the Gordon Highlanders in Singapore before the island fell to the Japanese in 1942. He managed to escape, but the capitulation of Singapore became his own personal humiliation. For many months, Lyon helped to organise an escape route through the island south of Singapore to Sumatra, then overland to Penang. It was at the mouth of the Indragiri River that he met a man named Bill Reynolds, who was in command of a captured Japanese fishing boat, the Kafuku Maru. Lyon would remember this vessel. Lyon eventually arrived in Australia with a plan. A plan to take a raiding party from Australia through the Lombok Straits, the Java and South China Seas, to Singapore itself. Foal boats would be used to attach limpet mines to the ships in the harbour. They would then return to the mother ship. But there was little interest in Lyon or his plans until Lord Gowrie, 
Governor General of Australia heard about it. He liked the idea and passed it on to General Blamey, who gave his approval for the raid to go ahead. Operation Jaywick had been born. Lyon's first requirement was a boat, and he wanted the Kafuku Maru. At that time, the vessel was in Bombay, which he had been renamed Krite, after a small venomous snake that inhabits India. She was ordered to Australia, but her old engines broke down repeatedly. She was finally hauled aboard a steamer, arriving in Sydney in November 1942. Meanwhile, Lyon had assembled some of the men who would take part in the raid. Second in command would be Lieutenant Donald Davidson, aged 32, Royal Naval Volunteer Reserve. Lieutenant Robert Page, aged 23, AIF. Lieutenant Hubert Cass, 41, Royal Australian Naval Volunteer Reserve. Cass would act as captain and navigator of the Krite. Leading stoker J.P. McDowell, 51, Royal Navy. Engineer McDowell was Irish, and he was referred to as Paddy. Leading telegraphist Horry Young, 22, Royal Australian Navy, would be the radio operator. Corporal R. Morris, Royal Army Medical Corps, 23. Born in Wales, he was naturally called Taffy. Corporal A. Crilly, 24, AIF, he was to act as cook. Final plans for the raid were drawn up at an old Victorian house in Domain Road, Melbourne. This was the headquarters of the Inter-Allied Services Department. Lyon and his men would be attached to Z Special Unit. Volunteers were called for to make up the remainder of the party. Training began at the Army Physical and Recreational Training School in Melbourne. Here they learned the art of unarmed combat, how to kill with their bare hands, a knife and a native parang. Lyon selected 17 of these men to continue training at Refuge Bay on the Hawkesbury River near Sydney. Refuge Bay was a remote area with a tiny beach. Its only access was by boat. A camp was established at the top of the cliffs near the beach. Here they learned to scale cliffs, to read maps and compasses. But most of their training was with the strange foal boats that would be used in the actual attack. They learned to handle the craft night and day and to paddle noiselessly in water smooth and rough. It was an 18 hour day, every day. From these men, Lyon and Davidson made their final choice. Each man was a member of the Royal Australian Navy. Leading seaman K. Kane, 27. Able seaman Walter Falls, 21. Able Seaman F. Marsh, 18. Able Seaman M. Berryman, 18. Able Seaman A. Jones, 21. And the youngest of the party, A. Houston, aged 17. He was usually called happy as he rarely smiled. Such were the 14 men who made up the Jaywick party. On January 18, 1943, the crate left Refuge Bay on the first leg of her voyage to Cairns, but her old engine was worn out, breaking down six times before finally being towed into Townsville and then to Cairns. Unless another engine could be found for the crate, the raid would be cancelled. A new Gardner diesel was located in Hobart, Tasmania, and was quickly flown to Cairns and fitted into the crate. It was here that Lyon, Davidson, Page and Cass joined the crate. They had completed their training at Z Experimental Station, better known as the House on the Hill. On 9th of August 1943, the Crite left Cairns to begin the next stage of her journey, the two and a half thousand miles to Exmouth Gulf. There was little for the men to do now. Their only entertainment was from Young's Air Force transceiver radio. At Exmouth Gulf, the equipment and stores were loaded and battened down, and on September the 1st, the Krite headed north into the Indian Ocean, making for the Lombok Straits, 750 miles away.
As they neared Lombok Straits between the islands of Bali and Lombok, Lyon ordered the men to stay in their bodies and wear the native sarongs that had been provided at Exmouth Gulf. Then the blue ensign was lowered and the flag of the Japanese Empire raised on the Krite's stern. To all intents and purposes, the Krite was now a harmless native fishing boat. On the night of 7th September, the Krite closed on Lombok, but her top speed of six and a half knots barely made headway against the tide racing out from the Bali Sea. Lyon had hoped to clear Lombok well before daybreak, but dawn was upon them before they cleared the straits. Early fishermen could be seen near the shore of Bali. The sun was clear of the horizon as they moved into the Bali Sea in full sight of the 10,000 foot peak of Gunung Agung, the sacred mountain of Bali and Japanese held territory. The crowd continued due north to round the Kangian group of islands, then northwest towards the southern tip of Borneo. At the sight of native proas, cars would alter course away. Just south of the island of Pontianak, the Krite turned due west to make for the Rio Archipelago and Temiang Strait. Occasionally a Japanese plane would pass overhead, but the men would wave to allay any suspicions the pilot may have. It was decided that the island of Pompong would be used to pick up the men after the raid, but they moved on in search of an island suitable for a rear base. They decided on Panjang, which had a tiny beach perfect for their purpose. They were now within 40 miles of Singapore. Stores, foal boats, and six of the raiders were quickly transferred to the beach. Crite turned away. She would cruise the islands for two weeks before returning to Pompong to pick up the raiding party. For Cass and the remainder of the men of the Crite, the waiting would be the hardest part, as Cass was to note in the logbook. Resting by day and travelling by night, the three foalboat crews began their island hopping journey to Singapore. Lyon chose Dongus Island from which to launch the attack, but they found the currents too strong and moved to nearby Shuba Island, just 10 miles from Singapore. Not far away were the useless guns of the British, their barrels pointing south. They had waited for an enemy that never came. Two foal boats manned by Page and Jones, Lyon and Houston would head for the ships in the examination anchorage in Bukem Island. Davidson and Falls would make for Keppel Harbour. With further to go, they left Subal before the other two parties. Reaching the Empire Dock, Davidson and Falls moved silently alongside the wharves, but there was no large ships there or in Keppel Harbour. They turned back and moved towards the outer roads. There was no lack of targets here. Davidson and Falls closed in. Three limpet mines would be attached to each ship, linked by cord text to ensure that they would explode simultaneously.
They worked in silence, completely unobserved in the darkness. With three ships mined, their supply of limpets was exhausted. By arrangement, Davidson and Falls would make their own way back to Pompong and rendezvous with the Krite. Meanwhile, Page, Jones, Lyon and Houston had returned to Dongas. They had mined four ships between them, one of these a tanker, having spent ten hours in the foal boats. The mines had been set to explode at 5am, but by 5.15 the harbour remained quiet. To the four men waiting anxiously on Dongas, it appeared that something had gone wrong. Then suddenly the harbour of Singapore erupted. Thousands of war prisoners in Changi heard the explosions. They were never told by the captors what had happened, but obviously the Japanese were angry as the meagre food ration was cut in half. By mid-morning, a thick pall of smoke hung over the harbour, but the raiders had moved to the other side of Dongus Island and were resting in readiness for their journey back to the Krite. They had damaged or sunk seven ships, a total of almost 40,000 tonnes. While the Japanese concentrated their search for the raiders in the Malacca Straits, believing the raid had been launched from India, the four men headed south. At midnight on the 2nd of October, the Krite returned to pick up the six men, then turned away to once more make for the Lombok Straits. Night had fallen as they moved between the islands of Bali and Lombok. At 11.30, a Japanese patrol boat suddenly appeared off their port quarter. The men on the Krite froze. For 30 minutes, the patrol boat held station, the Krite obviously under observation. Then, precisely at midnight, the Japanese ship veered away and made off in the direction of Lombok. 180 miles south of Lombok, Horry Young broke radio silence to contact Kunawara Wireless Station near Darwin. There was no reply. Two days later, Young made contact with Fremantle. Jaywick was over. They had travelled almost 5,000 miles in 47 days, 33 of them in Japanese-held territory. From Exmouth Gulf, the men returned to their units, but they were to meet again at the Z staging camp in Jordan Terrace, Brisbane, to celebrate the success of the raid. But the sound of Jaywick had barely faded before Ivan Lyon began to plan his second raid against Singapore.